sometimes it causes me to tremble. The fundamentals of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we usually say the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. But we live in an age that does not in general tremble as some did in past times because they simply do not have the reverence and respect for deity or divine things. We as the church in striving to be faithful as the New Testament defines it, First Timothy or rather verse 15, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 58. We must recognize that because regardless of the times in which we live, we're to be preaching the truth, we're to be the leavening for good in the world as we live like the New Testament teaches. So what is the obligation on us? to do our best to call people by the gospel back to an attitude toward God that is full of reverence and awe and godly fear lest they lose their souls because it is a fearful thing the inspired writer of the Hebrews said to fall in the hands of God when you're unrepentant not a believer. In Romans 1, in verse 1, as Paul begins his letter to the church at Rome, he says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, then he said, separated unto the gospel of God. Our focus this morning in this lesson is on separated unto the gospel of God. He was dedicated in any way and in every way possible for a person to be faithful to what it is that God expects a member of the church to be, a Christian. He was called to sound out the gospel. From reading the New Testament, he desired to go into places where the gospel had never been heard at that time because sometimes we forget it, but the gospel was new to the world. And many people did not know it. Before he could do that, he had to be then separated from his previous life. And remember, in his previous life, he said this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1. I'll look at verse 13 and verse 15. He said that he had been a blasphemer. That's one who speaks against God and godly things. And a persecutor and injurious because he persecuted the church. He led the early persecution of the church. He held the clothes of those that killed the first Christian martyr, Stephen, as they stoned him to death. He was injurious, he said. But we learned something about him. I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and in unbelief. He did not believe the gospel. He actually thought he was opposing these Christians because they were false teachers. Now, after he had come to belief in Christ, after he had repented of all that life and had been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38, and concerning his own conversion, Acts 22, verse 16, then there was a great change in his thoughts his words, his actions, what was important to him, what was not. He said of himself in Philippians 3, 
I'll look at verse 7 and verse 13. But what things were gained to me, those I kind of lost for Christ. That is just a very good commentary on what Christ meant in Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Nothing meant more to him than serving God, being faithful to God. And so he goes ahead to say in verse 13, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth of those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I want to notice that last part. Where did he do this? In Christ Ephesians 1, 3, Paul would write, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places are in Christ. And he would write in Galatians 3 and verse 27 that a believer is baptized into Christ. And thus the doorway into Christ. That's how Paul became separated from the past. He's not like he was when the things of this world concerned him, and he really didn't care much about what Christ said. Now, he was a religious person. Let's not forget that. He was not an immoral person. His morality before he became a Christian was in accordance with the law of Moses, which meant there wasn't any change about anything in Paul's morality in his conversion. But being a good, fine, upstanding moral person won't cut it as far as one's salvation is concerned. When we look at the first uncircumcised Gentile convert in Acts chapter 10, we see him believer in God. And he's described as a devout man just like those on the day of Pentecost gathered in Jerusalem as Jews were devout. But his morality as an uncircumcised Gentile would not save him. He had to be right with God according to the New Testament teaching. His religion had to change because it was a false religion. Now let me emphasize this point as we go further. You can be the finest moral person on this earth and be lost. One must be right with God religiously. So he was separated from the past when he became a new creature. And he changed states of being in the world and being baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27, into a state of favor, baptized into into Christ for the remission of sins. And thus, the first thing we want to notice is that he was separated from sin. And you'll see that after his call, the gospel call, the gospel to be preached to every creature for it's God's power to save us, Romans 1, 16, Mark 16, 15. He was making sure that his life was in harmony with the will of Jesus Christ. You'll remember that on the road to Damascus, the Lord appeared to Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor, the old man in sin. And he says of himself, he breathed out threatenings and slaughter. In other words, he was a very bold persecutor of the church. Now, in the book of Acts, written by the inspired Luke, three times that conversion is mentioned in Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. But on that road, the Lord identified himself, not because he had to appear to him so he could be saved, but he was to be an apostle of Christ. Thus, he would have to, by his own eyewitness, say, I have seen the Lord, which he would. 
So after the Lord had identified himself, Paul says, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? There was no gainsaying. This one who I've been saying was a false Messiah, a blasphemer and claiming to be the Son of God, and all those who would follow him, lo and behold. I don't think we can know what, how that jarred him to his core when our Lord said, I am Jesus of Nazareth whom thou persecutest. Well, he was told, because he was struck blind by that great light, that he was to arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Chapter 9, 5 through 6. Well, he's a believer in Christ, is he not? But he's more than one who, through the word and his testimony, was brought to believe in Christ. He's seen the Lord. He is one that is an apostle now, for the Lord has appointed him to be so. And after three days and three nights without food or drink, the Lord had already appeared to a Christian, a preacher of the gospel by the name of Ananias, and sent him to Saul, who was in the process as a blind man, not eating and not drinking. You ever wonder what went through his mind? Because he's received such a blow to what he was firmly convinced was the truth and now he finds out he's been fighting God instead of serving God. What must have been going on in his mind all those days of how I've wasted the church of God? How I've been opposed to the one I've looked for? How I've been diametrically opposed to the gospel that saves? You know, sometimes before a person can truly be converted in all of that means to Jesus Christ, he's got to come on the full weight of the fact that my life has been a mess and I made it that way. I don't care how sincere I was in what I was doing, how religious I was, or how moral I was. I was not living like the Lord wanted me to do. In fact, I was denying the very thing that I wanted to do, and that is be pleasing to God. Well, what, what he was to do was made known to him now. Jesus says, I have a work for you to do. And he says, thou shalt be his witness, that is Christ's witness, unto all men. That's what an apostle could do because they had actually seen the Lord. He says, you're going to be a witness of all you've seen and what you've heard. That being the case, that's as then and I spoke to him. In 22, chapter 22 of Acts, verses 15 to 16, Ananias realizes this man is a believer. He's a penitent person. He's qualified to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ to obtain the remission or forgiveness of sins. So when he realizes, I'm speaking to a man qualified to obey the gospel, a believer who's repented of sins, he says, and now, why tarryest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The grammatical construction means that you're arising and being baptized because that's the way you appeal to the authority of the Lord, to him to save you. That's what Peter was saying in Acts 2, verse 38, to believers, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ by his authority for the remission of sins. So it was only when he had washed away his sins in baptism, because in baptism you're baptized in the death of Christ. Why is that significant? Because it was in Christ's death on the cross he shed his blood for the remission of the sins of men. And Romans 6, 7, 18, Paul himself says, you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, that pattern of teaching, which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. You became the servants of righteousness. That's not said of a person who believes in Christ only. That's said of the person who believes and is baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. Thus he's saved from past sins. He's a Christian. Now, watch it. Please think with me. If he was saved before 
he was baptized. Saul himself didn't know it. For he was fasting and praying. And in the place where the Lord sent him to, to await what he must do to be saved. If he was saved, then the Lord himself didn't know it. That doesn't make much sense, does it? For he promised it would be told him in Damascus what he must do. And if he was saved before his baptism, the one whom Jesus selected to send to him, Ananias, didn't know it. For he told him what to do to wash away his sins. And yet this is already a believing, penitent man. And I don't think a person could have been any more believing and penitent than Saul of Tarsus. And if Saul was saved before this, he was one of the most miserable saved persons you ever knew. For look at his state before he was baptized. Yet he had seen Jesus. He believed in Jesus. Why the denominational world will cling tenaciously in the face of the truth of the Bible as to exactly at what point a person is saved by Christ is beyond me. But if the people of Jesus' day who call for his crucifixion, having had the law as a schoolmaster to bring them unto Christ for 50 1,500 long years could cry, crucify him, crucify him. And if Saul, as dedicated a person as he was, could not see in Jesus Christ, or the message early Christians spoke, like Stephen, does that tell us that we had better be so very careful about how we view these things ourselves? That we can deceive ourselves, for there is a way that seems right unto us but the end thereof are the ways of death so he was separated from sin we see exactly when he was made free from sin and when the Lord added him to the church Acts 2.47 the next point is that Saul of Tarsus is separated from family and friends all my life I've watched people give up a lot of things Yes, some of them will even give up friends. But I've noted when it comes to family that brethren can become very quickly like the deceived Jews of their day. If it means choosing between their loved ones, their family, and Christ, they're just not going to do it. They're going to justify themselves in clinging to their lost flesh and blood. Now after coming to Christ, Saul could no longer stay in the faith that had been his parents' faith that had been his. As other converts in the first century, He had to, he was required to, turn for the tenets that he had held, that he cherished, that he had practiced. And this immediately separated him from his former associates who continued to practice them and believe in them and stand up for them. Of course, that would have included his family, wouldn't it? If they had remained in that given situation. Later, he would write, men and brethren, I'm a Pharisee. I'm the son of a Pharisee. Of course, that was said in Acts 23 and verse 6 regarding his upbringing, his background in the Jews' religion. But he renounced Judaism as far as it being that which brought him to Christ. He knew only through Christ and the gospel and his belief and obedience to him to him in the gospel could he be saved. So all of that 
would have hindered him, would have blocked him from following Christ. But he was no longer in that particular fraternity. He mentioned in Galatians 1, 15 through 16, when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately, I conferred not with flesh and blood. What that saying is, I heard the truth myself. And I understood it. And I knew its requirements of me. And I didn't have to deal with anybody else. And as an apostle of Christ, he received direct revelation from Jesus Christ. He didn't have to confer with anybody else. God had separated him from his mother's womb, which simply means God in his omniscience already knew the heart of this man. He knew that when the gospel came to Saul, he would believe and obey it. Didn't mean he didn't have to obey it. It meant he had to obey it or he would obey it. This sort of sounds like what was said about Abraham. When God said, I know him, he will command his children, they will obey him. So he was separated from his family ties and his ties with his friends and the old way he worshiped God. But you know, none of that separation came except he willed it so to be because it was demanded of him if he were to live faithful to God in the church. He was separated, and you have already seen this, from the law of Moses and living it and approaching God as if that's the way we approach God. Look among the denominational world. They make no real distinction between the law of Moses and the gospel of Christ. But when he was separated, that is Saul, from the life of sin, the old life, the old man of sin, under the gospel, then he was separated from living according to the law as the way to please God. Listen to what he said concerning how he lived as a Jew when he was under the law. My manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews which knew me from the beginning, if they would testify that after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. Acts 26, verses 4 and 5. And, and notice this again, he said, in Philippians 3, 4 through 7. If any man thinks that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, now, that's the way they would describe the Jews who trusted the flesh. Remember, they thought they were acceptable to God because they were descendant fleshly from Abraham through Jacob, and that's all it took. And some of them tried to say, Paul is a latecomer, he's not really an apostle. So they tried to discredit his apostleship. And thus, Paul is saying, all right, you compel me. I'll just compare my life with yours when I was living under the law. And he says, if any man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. I can beat you at your own game is what he's saying. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews. As touching the law, the Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church. Touching the righteousness which is of the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, and that's where we read a while ago, those I counted lost for Christ. What did Paul give up? Everything that stood between him and being faithful to his Lord. I don't think anybody who was a Jew that was converted to Christ 
or a Jew who was unbelieving in Christ who still tried to approach God under the law. Could I have a finer record when he was under the law? But now Paul separated himself from all this. And why? To be of Christ. Remember, the word Christian means of Christ. He said he profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceeding zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Galatians 1.14. Can you stop and think of Paul doing like I've heard a number of people do all my life, and I'm sure they still do? Well, if I obey the gospel, my mother and daddy, they didn't. They didn't know about it. I just can't do that. I'll condemn them. That's fallacious reasoning to begin with. Can you conceive him saying that? Not from his own testimony and inspired writ. Not at all. I'm willing to give up anything and all things to be faithful to the Lord. That's what he's saying. Why is this in the Bible? What do you get out of it for your own life when you read it? Well, he had to do the separating. He's the one that made the choices. Notice that Christ had taken away the law of Moses as the way the Jews would approach God in faithful service. He says he blotted out the handwriting of the ordinances that was against us and contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross, Colossians 2.14. So it was because of Christ that the apostle Paul, when he became a Christian, separated, was separated from the law of Moses. And writing to the Ephesian brethren in Ephesians 2, verses 14 and 15, he says of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one, meaning Jew and Gentile, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. The thing that separated them was the law. And he says, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Enmity means hate. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So Saul looked no longer when he became the Apostle Paul. He looked no longer at the law of Moses as necessary for salvation. And he says for those who did as false teachers came teaching in the churches of Galatia, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Galatians 5, 4. I don't know how people today, in believing 2 Timothy 2, 15, of studying to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, can read this passage of Galatians 5, 4 and still follow a man-made doctrine that says, well, once you become a Christian, you cannot so sin as to be eternally lost. You fall from grace... And you're lost. And he said to those people who were following these Judaizing teachers, he said, you Gentiles can be saved, but in order to do that, you must be circumcised and keep the law. He made it very clear that you try to do that and you've fallen from the favor of God. <laughs> so he understood the place of the New Testament of Christ as the gospel system and how it saved in faith and repentance and obedience to the gospel and being baptized into Christ and the life one is to live as a new creature in Christ, separating himself from anything and all things that stops him from being faithful to God. He was separated from the world. In other words, he renounced the world to serve Jesus Christ. Remember, Christ had said plainly in John 18, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. He said that to Pilate. And he had also stated that the apostles had been separated from the world to be witnesses, eyewitnesses, we would say, to the Christ. And he said, if ye were of the world, that is, Christ did, as he worked on this earth in his ministry to prepare the people for the kingdom when it would come, so they would know how to live in it. If you were of the world, the world would love his own. 
but because you're not of the world, I've chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hates you. Again, John 15, 19. As I said earlier, though Paul was an apostle, as one born out of due time, 1 Corinthians 15, 8, in other words, he became apostle later date than all the others whom Jesus called when he was on the earth. He had to live a life separated from the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those things he put to death, they did not guide him any longer. The only thing that guided him was the will of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Thus he gave thanks to God. Now here's what he said to the Colossians in Colossians 1, verse 13. He gave thanks to God because here's what he thought who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. And then, by the way, as a passing thought, those who claim the kingdom of Christ is yet out there in our future to be established, what do they do about this? Paul said to the Colossians almost 2,000 years ago that we've been translated into the kingdom of God's dear son. Obviously, you can't be in something that didn't exist but they were existed in the kingdom 2,000 years ago when the book of Colossians was written. That must say that somebody's got a false concept of the kingdom if they think it's yet to be established in our future. Later, he would encourage others, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Why? That ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God, Romans 12:2. He so separated himself from the world that he could say, yea, doubtless. And I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, from who, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Philippians 3.8. You know one reason we in the church don't know our Bibles like we should, though we may have been members of the church for a long time? I'll prove it to you, and your own mind will convict you. How much time did you spend with the Bible between last Sunday and now? But the Lord means all there is to you, doesn't he? Why, he's the greatest thing in your life, isn't he? You expect him to look at you on the day of judgment and say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. How much time did you spend in the study of the Bible since last Sunday? How much time did you spend in prayer since last Sunday? Need I say more? Paul had true motivation, the kind we need. He said in Galatians 6, 14, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. It's obvious what it takes to be faithful in the church as God expects of us. It's Christ of the world. There's no other way you can look at it. Paul made the right choice. He made the only choice if you're going to heaven. Now, he portrayed the church as it should be. When people make light of the church, they make light of the blood of Christ because it was the blood of Christ that purchased the church. Was the church Christ built worth the purchase price? Christ also loved the church, he wrote, and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it by the washing of water by the word. Why? That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Paul didn't want any corrupting influence in any form or fashion to any degree brought in. So we find him writing in 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 17, Wherefore, come ye out from among them, and be ye separate, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You can't just say you're a Christian and go ahead and do like everybody else in the world. 
great many people are deluding themselves to think they can go out and live like the world, think like the world, enjoy the things that are of the world, affiliate, associate, and company with those who are of the world, and then come into the worship of God on Sunday and say, everything's all right. Well, what have you been doing the rest of the time? Have you been living Christian life? Or have you been cultivating that which is of this present world and must come to an end? And many times, much sooner than anybody thinks. It was John who wrote in 1 John 2, verses 15 and 17, Love not the world. Question, did Paul follow that? Certainly did. He was separated from the world. He was separated unto, in order to, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said that in Galatians 2 and verse 16. When he was baptized into Christ, he set off immediately to strive to convert others. To do what he could where he was. And yet, you know, he would have to grow himself spiritually. It would be many, many years before he went on that first preaching tour. But he did what he could where he was. He was totally given over to that task. He confessed, for though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. 1 Corinthians 9, 16. Would to God all of us felt that way according to our several abilities and position in the church. In the same letter, he stated, For I determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 2. And again, I say, as he arose from the watery grave of baptism, he began his work. Notice what he said. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he was the Son of God. Acts 9 20. Straightway. And from that time forth, as he said, he was separated under the proclamation and defense of the gospel, saying, I am set. That Greek word means like set like concrete. I am set for the defense of the gospel, Philippians 1.17. It bothers me when I watch members of the church try to be set for everything but the defense of the gospel. They don't have any problem intellectually of gaining all sorts of things and emphasize the importance of it to educate yourself for a few years on earth. But how far will they go and how much sacrifice is there about them to know the Bible and to live it out in their lives? You know already the labors that he put forth. He reminds us of what all he suffered because he chose the route he chose to go, the straight and narrow way that leads to heaven. And there was a passion for lost souls that drove him on. Here's what he said. So that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Romans 15, 19. That's all that's on his mind. He was separated then into the work of God when he obeyed the gospel. Now it was early in his Christian life while he was working with Barnabas at Antioch of Syria that the Holy Spirit called him and here's what is said as Luke records it separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them remember he was told by Ananias because Jesus told him that that he was going to be called to do these things now what's interesting between the time of his conversion and what we've read right here in Acts 13 too, many many years have passed by all that time, all that he went through in preaching the gospel where he could and doing what he could wholeheartedly and completely to serve Christ, that was really getting him ready for what most of the book of Acts writes about him. We don't have the patience and the long-suffering and the steadfastness with ourselves with others to realize that while we pray, if we do, to be strong in the Lord and faithful and ready unto every good work, just what all that may take of us 
and how long it will take for us to grow into that faithfulness. But we must understand that. You cannot teach what you don't know. You cannot live when you're not able to live it. Paul was separated from many brethren by his call, but he never looked back. He said, yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel. Not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation. Romans 15, 20. What is that saying? I want to go to where the gospel has never been heard. I want to go to people that don't know the thing about the church. Paul was rooted. He was grounded and he was solid in the faith, which means the gospel system. And yet he was one who was forever on the move. Why? Doing the work of an apostle and the work of an evangelist. Well, we bring all this down to us and we have to ask ourselves the question, what are we separated into? What means more to us than life in the flesh itself? What do we do with our lives according to our several abilities? Let me pause by saying simply this. I mentioned in the devotional talk on Wednesday night little things that people do that are in harmony with God's will that amount to great things as far as God is concerned. Remember, when we sing the song of just a cup of water is placed within your hand, then just a cup of water is all right in the hand. And that comes from Christ saying, that if you give a cup of water to somebody in my name, that I know about it. Brethren, you hear a lot today about the denigration of a person being a good wife and a good mother and a good homemaker. Why well, is that all she's going to be? Well, I don't think there's anything wrong with her preparing to help herself secularly. If such is needed, you don't know. But what should come first for somebody that's married first of all marry like the bible said next of all know the role of a wife and the role of a mother and also know as husbands the role of husbands and fathers now why am i saying that well i want you to think of noah for a moment i mentioned this a week or so ago if noah and ms noah had done what they did or if everybody else had done what they did, there wouldn't have been a flood. The great service we do to God may not seem great, and most of the time doesn't as far as the world's concerned, but just being godly and faithful, as we've studied from the Bible, faithfulness is. As a godly husband and a godly wife and mother and father, is wonderful. When we come to the raising of Dorcas, remember the little song we sing? The Bible we find Dorcas was very kind. She was full of good works for the poor. There's nothing said about her except that she was mindful of the poor folks and the widows all cried. Because widows had nobody to help them. Dorcas did. And they showed the garments that she had made. Little thing to us? God did not think it was a little thing. It was a great thing. And if everybody had the milk of human kindness that Dorcas had, then the benevolent disposition, look at the people that would be helped. And yet we have to have some great government program, some great whatever. Have you ever noticed how we have to just do great things from the world's definition of greatness? Not so. The Bible says of Jesus Christ that he was holy, harmless, separate from sinners, Hebrews 7.26. Sound like me? That's a good example for you and me. Holy, harmless, and separate from sinners. But we must be separated from sin. We must die to sin. We must set our mind on the heaven above through the truth of the gospel. Acts 2 and verse 38. And we may have to be, not automatically, but we may have to be separated from family and friends for the gospel's sake. Luke 14, 26. We must be separated from every false teaching and every false teacher, 2 Corinthians 6, 17. We must be separated from the world. Again, let me remind you, things of the world are the way the world lives, the passions of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Christians do not live on that level. 
1 John 2, 15 through 17. We walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And since faith comes by hearing the word of God, we walk as the word of God leads and guides and directs us, regardless of what appears to our five senses. And we must also be separated unto the gospel, as the Bible teaches Paul was. And remember this, good place to close. He said, be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1. Now let me ask you something. Can we still follow that advice? Oh, not only are we able to, but we must. So as Jesus was separate from sinners, so we as members of his spiritual body must be separate from sinners. Now we studied in this lesson exactly at what point a person becomes a Christian. And we urge you at this time to listen to the words of this song designed to cause you to reflect upon the message of the gospel and ask yourself, Am I ready to meet my Lord who died for me? And if I do, as I'm now living, will he say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. You've got to make up your mind. You're either living for the Lord or you're not. You're either succumbing to the call of the things around you to gratify the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the vain glory or pride of life, or you're not. You must make that decision. Everyone must. Paul did. He made the right decision. Now, as a child of God, have you slipped back into the ways of the world? Well, you need to make a decision to turn from those things, fully repenting of them, willing to confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. Now, where do you stand before God now? Will you honestly search your mind and say, if I died now, I would enter in to the glories of the Lord in the sense of I'm acceptable to Him. You can answer it. Now, God knows, and you know. But if you can't say that by the way you're living right now, you need to have the courage and the love of God and the care for your own soul to rise up and obey the gospel of Christ. If you're subject to the Lord's blessed invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.